Hello, and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Dr. Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new Teen Therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. His latest book, Feeling Great, contains powerful new techniques that make rapid recovery possible for many people struggling with depression and anxiety. Dr. Burns is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. David and I are happy to announce that there will be the first ever Team CBT World Congress, August 18 through the 21st, to be held in Warsaw, Poland. Licensed therapists, Lay people and therapists in training are welcome to attend the Congress in person in Warsaw or join us online at a reduced registration fee. During these four days, an international team faculty, many of whom have been featured on this podcast, will present the entire team model from start to finish, from testing to methods. The Congress will feature interactive sessions in which participants can learn and practice all elements of the powerful team system while receiving expert coaching on team techniques. There will also be special topic workshops that will address trauma, cancer care, and low-intensity team CBT. All information about the Congress is available at www.teamcbt.com. Dot eu. That is www.teamcbt.eu. We look forward to seeing you there. Hello, Rhonda. <laughs> Hello, David, and welcome to all of our listeners to episode 301. We're welcoming our listeners around the country and across the world. And 301 and 302 are personal work episodes. Again, you and Jill did a workshop, and the the person who graciously agreed to be your patient, yours and Jill's patient, so to speak, um, Nosley, also agreed to let us post this as two podcasts. Yes, and we're very indebted to Nosley for so generously uh, sharing, uh, Nosley, your personal uh feelings, vulnerabilities, and insecurities with uh, the workshop and now with with the whole world, although the whole world won't be listening, only 90%. (laughs) 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 But many people will be listening and benefiting, honestly, uh, from the the work you you did. I think that not everybody, but almost everybody, and I can include Rhonda and David in, in this group, do struggle at times from pretty intense feelings of insecurity. And and we all kind of suffer in the same way. But when we're feeling insecure, we we get the feeling, I'm the only one who feels this way. And so when you say, here's what's going on with me, and you become very real, not only do you get the chance to heal yourself, but to touch the lives of a whole lot of other people as well. And we know that very well, because after we publish a a two-part live therapy podcast like this, we always get lots of wonderful emails from people who say, thank you, thank you, thank you. This podcast touched me and and actually changed my life. And if you're a therapist too, it can be helpful because as you know, team therapy is a new Really, I mean, it's a new way of treating people. There's a lot of overlap with cognitive therapy, but it's it's just massively different in so many ways. And one of the unique features is that we can often bring about rapid and dramatic change with people in a single therapy session. And that doesn't mean that your work is done after one, say, two-hour therapy session, but it does mean that most of your work is probably done. Uh, and uh, after that, a person has to continue to practice what, what, what they've learned in that one session. But the reason that Jill and I do this is so, and, and we will teach along the way and say, now we're doing testing, now we're doing empathy, now we're doing assessing resistance, and, and now we do uh, <clears throat> methods and then testing at the end. 
And so there's a lot for you to learn if you really listen and, and concentrate. And if you have questions, e email us and ask them and we'll include them in and ask David. And uh, also, I would urge you to, to read the show notes because I put a lot of time and effort into them. And the show notes for this episode with Nasley, Nasley are uh, uh, really uh, uh, pretty, pretty well done. It, it was surprising. There, there's a lot of great links for you and all kinds of, you know, cool shit, as the Buddha so often said 2,500 mm -hmm. years ago, <laughs> and that will enhance your, your learning if you read those show notes and, and, and look carefully at the links. Okay, well, let's dive in. All right. In part one, you're, you'll be hearing the... Uh, uh, the introduction of, of Nasley, uh, her uh, initial scores on the brief mood survey, her, her daily mood log will kind of set it up and uh, empathize. <clears throat> and then we'll ask Nasley to grade us in empathy. And in part two, the exciting conclusion of the session next week, you'll hear A, the assessment of resistance, M, uh, the methods that we used, and the final testing uh you 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 made one kind of neat neat point i don't know oh, should we make it talking? now or should we do it at the end let's do it at the end see if other people okay. catch it okay yeah that this amazing thing <laughs> <laughs> okay on with okay. the session okay great Honestly, <laughs> thank you so much yes um Sure, we'll go through your brief mood survey, but then what we'd like to do is uh, a, a find out kind of about this uh, uh, problem that you have. Uh, we, we selected it because we think it's something that many people in the workshop will be able to identify with uh, just feeling, you know, insecurity and, and maybe I'm not good enough. One thing that I was surprised to see your brief mood survey because your depression score was zero, indicating that right now you're not feeling at all depressed and no suicidal urges either. Uh, and just a tiny amount of anxiety, uh, you know, a little anxious and, and a little uh, worried, but uh, that goes from zero to 20. A score of two is really within the normal range and and no anger whatsoever. Now, what did jump out a little bit is that your happiness score on this five item version that we're using of the happiness scale goes from zero to 20. And your score was only uh, eight out, out of 20, uh, indicating that you're not feeling a lot of happiness at all. Your, uh, you know, your, your happiness was only moderate. That can go from not at all to extremely happy. Uh, and similarly with uh, hopeful and optimistic was only moderately. And then worthwhile and, and high self-esteem, that was only somewhat, again, can go from not at all to, to completely. And then your uh, feelings of uh, motivation and productivity is, is only moderate and pleasure and satisfaction in life is, again, only moderate. So there's a lot of room for improvement there in that happiness scale. And then on the relationship satisfaction uh, was 29 out of 30. Uh, who, who were you thinking about when you filled out the scale? Um, one of my family members. Oh, yeah. Well, the 29 is phenomenally high. So that's, yeah. that's a great, a great mm -hmm. strength. And I'm sure a source of joy for, for you, although Definitely. you want to get a lot more joy than, than you're having right now. And then you indicated that you've been doing a, a moderate amount of homework on your own before this session, which was good to see. So why don't you, uh, we'll jump into the, the empathy a little bit and kind of, why don't you tell us what's been going on and then we'll, we'll go over your daily mood log as, as well. But again, thank you so much. It just uh, means a lot to me and Jill and everyone to meet you. And uh, I, I hope this will be a, a, a tremendous experience for you. Um, I would like to thank you a lot for giving me this opportunity. I hope like my kind of like struggles will be helpful for others who, ex I mean, if there are any who experience it. I'm sure that will be the case. So, yeah, thank you. 
So tell us a little bit um, about what's been going on for you. You reached out to us. You said, I'd like to volunteer and I'm struggling. So tell us what you're struggling with and truly what, what you're looking for help with today. Um, so I've been an anxious child since my, since my childhood. I would even say I have a generalized anxiety disorder. And that's how I developed um, interest in psychology in college. And then I did my master's in clinical psychology and I wanted to be a therapist. And so my first job was 10 years ago. I started working at the counseling center of a university back here. And actually I was, I was very good at my job. I always got very good feedback from my bosses and everything, but I quit my job at the end of two and a half years because I was having a lot of performance anxiety in front of the clients and students. And then, so I quit the field. I went to an uh, other, I got an other ad administrative job. Um, so I did that for four years. But then, like, I decided that the clinical side is much better, fits with my personality. Um, and then, so three and a half years ago, I found I found a position and I started working as a psychologist at the oncology unit of a medical school here in Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, and I'm the only um, psychologist of the oncology department. So although I'm always getting good feedback from my bosses and, you know, like in general, I don't know about the patients. I, I mean, I guess I cannot satisfy everyone, but, but the thing is my performance anxiety goes on and I really want to quit this job again. Um, and I think uh, okay, I, I don't have any problem like doing public speaking or doing group therapy or giving trainings. And I love that. And I was not anxious, maybe very, very slightly, like I would say very normal functional anxiety before, right before this workshop. But then when I'm in front of the clients, I have so much high performance anxiety that again, like I constantly like criticize myself and I'm always uh, a fear of making a mistake. And that's why I, again, like I cannot, I would say progress myself. And because sometimes I'm so occupied with my own thoughts that maybe I sh could have done much better things, but I have so much anxiety. So that's the, and I started therapy. Um, so let's see how it's how it will go. That's that's great. Let me go over your daily mood log and also find out how you how you feel when you're with with a client. Uh, but you mentioned that, uh, and I think you had a more little further write up. But the daily mood log just has the short version of, of thoughts that, that you're triggered when you're in a session with a patient, but you tell yourself uh, th things like, uh, and and if you who were watching us, uh, you, you'll find this on pages four and five. And let you know, me just say, David, just because mm -hmm. I think people will feel confused that um, David is just kind of looking at Nasli's thoughts on the daily mood log um, in a way to empathize with her. So we're definitely not moving <laughs> to using the daily mood log to try to change anything, but rather as part of sort of understanding Nasli's story, David's going to kind of connect with and share right. and ask more about her feelings and thoughts. right and it sounds like ever since you've been a little girl i mean just to summarize what you've said so far you've yeah. done great at things um, and your heart is really into doing clinical work but that when you're with patients you uh, start giving yourself a lot of negative mes messages that causes a lot of uh, tremendous distress for you and you would just love it to be able to to get over this this problem today but you tell yourself things like what if i miss psychopathology or make a wrong diagnosis that then i'll make a mistake and harm the patient and and making a mistake means i am bad i i should never make a mistake and and you believe that 80 percent when when it's going through your mind and 
and then I'm inadequate. I, I don't know what I'm saying, so the client won't be satisfied, and the client will give negative feedback to my boss, and I'll be fired, and you believe that 80%, and if I don't fix the client and make that person satisfied, uh, then he or she will judge me negatively and, and think poorly about me, and you believe that 80%. And and then you have more similar thoughts uh, on, on page five. You know, I've been in the profession a long time, but I'll never be good enough because of my anxieties and ruminations. I better quit. It's so hard to be good at it. And you believe that a hundred. And, uh, and, and if I don't do this adequately, then I better not do it at all. And you believe that 90 and... And there are third wave psychotherapies. What if Dr. Burns approach is incomplete and doesn't take this into account, then my training will be incomplete and I'll not be useful to the patient. And that's a 90%. And if I cannot do a case formulation, it's hard to do it. I, I won't have an adequate foundation. I, I must have a PhD to be adequate, not make a mistake. And 90% uh, of the reason I'm laughing is I did an interview or I did a Q&A for the British uh, team CBT group uh, on Friday. And one of the questions was uh, to explain about the case formulation approach which you're saying you, you you don't understand. And my student, Jackie Person, cr created that and wrote a book on it. I even put a foreword in her book. But I'm s such a slow reader, I never read the book. <laughs> so I never found out what it was. And here I was supposed to be explaining to the British group what the case formulation is. And I just said to the person who asked the question, well, tell me what your thoughts are about that. <laughs> so I, I managed to, to work around it. But I, I, I really smiled when I saw that you had that, that, that thought because I had that one on Friday. But tell me now, no sleep, when you're with uh, clients and you have these kind of thoughts, how anxious and worried and panicky do you feel between uh, zero and 100? Um, inside myself, I probably 70. 70. So in the percent now on page four, put 70 next to the, the anxiety uh, list there. And do you feel any uh, sad, blue, depressed, down, or unhappy when, when you're with clients and feeling inadequate? Um, not when I'm with clients, but sometimes afterwards, <laughs> especially if I believe that I was not helpful. Sure. And then how, how sad do you feel between zero and 100? Um, I 60, 70. 60 to 70, good. And put that in the percent now column on your page four. Can you write that in? Nasli, I just want to make sure you're with us. So you have the handout packet, page four, with your daily mood log on it, or just printed out version of your own daily mood log. Um, I don't have that, but... I you don't have the handout packet for the workshop? No, I do have the handout okay. packet. So, but it's yeah, so turn to page four. It's important because we want you to be writing for sure as we're writing, and we do this with all of our patients, okay. too. So mm -hmm. turn to page four in the handout packet. Do you see that? Daily mood log? That's right, yeah. Yeah, so that's the daily mood log that you sent to us. And so we're, again, just gathering data here, and then I think we should... Uh, kind of step off the daily mood log and just spend a little time connecting with you and empathizing. But on the first row, you said you feel those sad feelings about 70%, right? So write that in right. the now column. Mm -hmm. And all, everybody who's watching should be doing the same thing. And then on the next row, anxious, worried, panicky, nervous, frightened, you also said 70%? Or maybe 80? Okay, we'll put an, put an 80 there. And then how um, in the next row is guilty, remorseful, bad, or ashamed? Do any of those feelings uh, resonate? Um, much less. But for example, it happened with a few of the clients. So that mm -hmm. depends on the client and their kind of like feedback. or. Mm -hmm. And then what, what feelings? Would there be bad, ashamed? Which ones? Uh, bad and ashamed. A circle those two. And how strong is that sometimes if you feel you didn't do a good job? Um, 
I, I had this patient, a young patient who was dying. And so I stopped by her. And once she told me that, like, she didn't like me, why I, like, she was so angry and she was projecting probably her anger towards me. And I felt like 100% the shame. 100, put 100, that's sad. But that, yeah, but that does not happen with all the patients. It's yeah, just, sure, we'll put a parenthesis around that. Uh, well, actually, David, I think one one thing that's maybe a, an issue, usually we ask people to think of a moment in time, right? So I think we should be directing Nosley to think of, you know, the worst situation, right? What, what you're wanting help with is when you're feeling really awful, um, not when you're feeling good, right? So when you're saying yeah. sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't, let's have you actually picture a moment in time where you are feeling um, really uh, like I'm not doing a good job and I'm failing my patients, right? These are the thoughts that come up in those moments. And so I think we should be rating the feelings, right? In, in a specific moment in time when you're really struggling. Okay. Yeah. So can you, can you think of, is, is that, can you think of uh, a particular moment in time where you were really beating yourself up and feeling inadequate and telling yourself these thoughts here? Say during a session with a patient. That's right. So um, a young patient, she's 31 and she had advanced lung cancer and I met her at her first chemotherapy day and then she was hospitalized a couple of months later and then I went to visit her in her room at the hospital and she told me that she was so I don't want to talk to you um um because like I never felt a connection with you um I feel like uh what we talked before we're running like turning around the same subject and it's not helpful and um and she said those in a, in very angry words so I don't want to talk to you and um and I felt really 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 awful really ashamed and then started beating myself in myself and I was I felt like crying but I had to like stand professionally and I was like well thank you very much for telling me that and being uh, open and honest with me. Um, just know that I'm at the hospital doing your stay. If you want to reach me, you can reach me. And then I left the room and um, I felt as if like, uh, there's a Turkish saying like um, boiled water, um, just, uh, I had like boiled water over my head, which mm -hmm. means like yeah. I felt so awful um, and my heart was palp like I had part palpitations and then um, I started beating myself up and I'm like, why am I doing this job? I'm so inadequate and uh, I cannot even improve myself. As she said, we're turning around the same topics because I always ask myself, what, what should I say next? Or how can I help this dying patient? What, should, what can I say? And um, so this, not, this job is not for me. Um, I, I, should, I should just quit. Why am I even doing this? It gives me pain. So that, that was at that specific moment, but that was triggered by the patient's reaction, obviously, like this much of um, intense emotion. Yeah. Um, David, can I offer a little bit of empathy and then come back to reading the feelings? Sure. Yeah, so Nasli, that sounds like an incredibly stressful situation, and I can see that you're feeling... Um, you really feel for the patient. It sounds like you feel for all of your patients. You have a lot of empathy and you're um, wanting so much to do a good job by your patients. And um, you told us earlier that you're working kind of in the oncology department as a psychologist. And so I'm guessing that you're seeing a lot of patients who are struggling a lot and wanting to be there for them. And um, Sounds like when you're when you have a hard time with a patient where you when you feel like you fall short, um, or a patient in this case is kind of angry with you, saying, I don't want to talk to you, you're not helping me, um, that you feel really terrible about yourself, that you yeah. kind of beat yourself up and that you um 
you know, think I'm not good at this job and I should just quit this job and um, I can't help any of my patients. Um, and, and you shared with us earlier, right, that you did have something like that happen earlier in your career where you were working in counseling um, for, you said, about two and a half years. Um, and then at that point felt so kind of inadequate and incompetent and and you said you feel that way despite the fact that you get really good reviews. So um, I'm really feeling for you. It sounds like you're probably quite good at your job, but that your own negative thoughts and feelings are um, getting in your way. So it sounds like you quit your job about, uh, you quit your job after two and a half years and did admin work for a while, but you kind of feel this calling to really help patients and, and to do clinical work. And so you found your way back to clinical work, right? Working in this oncology department, but those thoughts and feelings are still there. You're still feeling inadequate and incompetent and having this kind of from performance anxiety, again, in the context of helping your patients, right? Yeah. Not, not public speaking, not teaching, yeah. but when you're one-on-one -on -one with patients, um, you're, you're frequently um, afraid that you're going to make a mistake, that you're not doing good enough work, um, and feeling feeling inadequate and, and you're feeling the urge to quit again because these feelings are so strong um is that am I, do, how am I doing on on empathy are you feeling like I'm getting you oh definitely exactly yeah that's how I feel yeah and I I feel um both sad for you knowing um you know how much your negative thoughts and feelings are getting in your way you know of 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 doing this work that you really love, it sounds like, and kind of feel passionate about. I, I also admire truly um, how seriously you take your job, right? And other people might see this angry patient and, and walk away and be like, well, she's just angry because, you know, she's got, she has this horrible illness, but you're taking things really seriously and you're wanting very much to look at your role and to to think about, um, you know, how you could be doing better for your patients. And I I totally admire that too. Yeah, that's exactly how you say. Yeah. How I feel and think. Yeah. And um, David, do you want to, you tell me, do you want to jump in? Do you want me to ask? Well, I, think, for, oh, I think you're doing, doing great chill. And, um, and, and, and then Nosley, uh, if you've got, you know, your page four there, how inferior, worthless, inadequate, defective, and incompetent do you do you feel uh, when you're with patients? You mean in general, or with respect to the example of Dr. Jill? Which direction would you like to go? Would you want to just focus on that one conflict with that one patient, Jill? Um, well, at least, yeah. I mean, I think I think. It, when, when Nosley is struggling in a moment, then this is when all these feelings come up for her, right? She's having a great session with the patient. We don't really need to help her with that, right? So, it's so I've, I've written down new negative thoughts then. Should we not use the ones that she sent in? I think those are all relevant too, right? Oh, like sure. Nosley, these oh, are, mm -hmm. I think all the thoughts she wrote down on the Daily Mood Log are totally fair game. Um, I'm not doing so, a good job. This job is not for me. Should I just yeah. put that type, type of thing? Totally. I mean, I would say that these thoughts, they exist at the baseline, yeah. but they even get intensified with certain triggering factors. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I think we should just say in a moment in time where you're struggling with the patient, right? How inferior, worthless, inadequate do you feel? So right after that uh, patient, um, I remembered myself taking the um, elevator, going back to my office, and then I felt inferior, worthless, inadequate, incompetent so much, like a hundred, mm. that I started like crying. Mm -hmm. That's so sad. Yeah. yeah. Can you put a hundred there in the uh, uh -huh. percent now column? I did. Uh, and uh, and then were there other thoughts going through your mind when you were crying? You've, you've given us such a beautiful list of painful thoughts. Um, let me think. Um, yeah, I had more like more bad generalization uh, based on 
my emotions and thoughts at the time. And I was like, look, like I'm 38 and many of my friends, um, they're much better at their career at a better place, but I'm still struggling to find my way in my career. So that even made me worse. Mm -hmm. So I'm writing that one down also. My friends are at a better place. Yeah. Uh-huh. Sure. And then uh, <laughs> when you were feeling, you know, kind of different from, from your friends at, at that moment, were you feeling lonely, unloved, unwanted, rejected, alone, or abandoned? Do any well, of those words resonate? You know, no, not really. So we'll just put a dash there. Were you feeling okay. any em embarrassment, foolishness, humiliated, self-conscious? that uh embarrassed and humiliated and maybe self-conscious conf i would say maybe 60 70 okay you can put 60 to 70 in the percent now and then circle okay. embarrassed humiliated and and self-conscious yeah okay and were you feeling any feeling of hopelessness discouragement pessimism or, or despair right because I was crying a lot I sure. cried not a lot but I cried and so which how's... ones which should we circle there Nasli on that row um all <laughs> all of them okay at what level you know I think at that time? moment like yeah me myself crying in the office yeah and how strongly were you feeling those from zero to a hundred Hundred, hundred percent. Were you feeling any uh, frustration, stuck, thwarted, defeated? Any of those words? Um, I felt frustrated. Uh, what does thwarted mean? Or I'll just like Google the same it. same thing. Oh, okay, because English is not my native language. So you're doing great, by the way. Oh, thank you. Um, I felt frustrated after a little bit. Uh, I would say maybe 40%. Sure, because, sure. Um, I was kind of rebellious at my state. Why am I like this? And why other many other people do not get affected as much as I, I am? So they can prolong with their career. Mm -hmm. And I can't because of my anxieties and all these beliefs. So I'm adding this as a new negative thought in the negative thought column. Why am I like this? Yeah. Uh, like I, sh I shouldn't be like this, I guess, right? Yeah. I'll, or I better, I wish I was not like this. Mm -hmm. Like, or why am I like, it's more like a, a mild version of um, a person who got a cancer diagnosis and he feels angry. So mm. that was, that was, I would say more frustrate. I, I guess I'm not very clear. Um, the difference between the words angry and frustrated. I was more angry. In circle angry. Any of the other words in the angry column, mad, resentful, annoyed, irritated, upset, furious. Um, angry, upset, resentful. I would say so. Um, we can eliminate the um, the row above, so we can eliminate frustrated, stuck, thwarted, defeated. Uh, but um, I would say forty for angry, resentful, for or fifty. Uh, great, forty to fifty. Great. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Well, thank you for that. So you kind of very anxious but you get kind of mad at yourself and, and mad at the fact that you have to struggle with this and looking at other people and thinking well they they don't have these problems and and and, and why why am i like this and <clears throat> exactly and i'm 38 and i've been missing a lot because of in life because of my anxieties so you can add that i'm 38 and and missing a lot i'm just writing these at the bottom of your daily mood log because they're more of more of your negative thoughts. I'm 38 and, and and missing a lot because of my anxiety, which is which is is true in in a way. And and I'm 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 just sad to hear that you're 
you, you know, having this steam over your head mm -hmm. when you're doing the thing that could be a, your greatest source of joy in your life is to be working with people and bringing them out of their negative moods and giving them hope and feelings of joy. Yeah. And you're doing, it sounds like you're doing some really beautiful work, but, but, but not, not feeling uh, that feeling of joy and uh, just, you know, constantly be beating up on, on yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, my heart, my heart goes out to you. And I just, I just feel a tremendous uh, respect for you and a tremendous liking for you and, and, and sad that you're just carrying this around all the time and i'm really glad that you 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 volunteered for the workshop and i'm i'm hopeful that we can do a little bit to turn this around for you today and i know for me clinic and i think maybe for jill and a lot of others are the clinical work is just about my greatest source of joy in my life mm. and uh it would be sure nice to to show you how to experience that as well Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for understanding me. Yeah, you're, you're very welcome. Um, yeah, and I um, also think a lot of therapists likely can identify with this feeling of a bit of, you know, perfectionism, if you will, right, around, of course, there are moments in time where we fail with our patients um, or aren't quite giving our patients what they need. Um, but it sounds like across the board, you're saying, you know, in this job and in your previous job that you got good feedback and that supervisors are saying that you're doing a good job. And yet it's that it should be, you know, hitting a home run with every single patient. Mm -hmm. And um, if I'm not helping this patient in this moment, then something is wrong with me and, and I'm not good enough. Um, and I, I just suspect that a lot of therapists who are watching can identify with those feelings um, and um, could probably learn a lot from what you're sharing with us today. So thank mm -hmm. you. I thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, and I, was, I, ha I oh, had a psychiatric ahead. resident at Stanford who come to our weekly training group, and you'd be welcome to come to one of our weekly training groups if if, if you like as well, Nosley. But uh, he he was working with a dying patient on the medical ward, but in a psychiatric sense, he was a psychiatric resident, and then. Uh, when his rotation ended, you know, you moved to another rotation. Right. And, um, and so it was his last session with the patient and the patient was about to die. Oh. <laughs> and, and, and he was feeling uh, v v very tearful. And he fought back his, his tears and, and said to the patient, well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll see you next time or something like that. And then he went to the residence room and started sobbing. And then when he came to the Tuesday group, he, he said, uh, you know, is it wrong for me to have been crying? And of course, his tears were for a different reason, but it was still the issue of tears. And, uh, and, and you know, what I what I said to him is, is that, you know, and he said, should I have shown my tears to the patient? And, you know, I, I said to him, absolutely, which is so, so such a beautiful thing about you. Um, you don't need to. You don't need to be ashamed of that. And sometimes, sometimes those tears are really the doorway to something beautiful. And that's how I feel about your tears as, as well. The grief that you felt at have, having fa failed this patient is showing so many beautiful things about you. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and with that, I'm, I'm just babbling. <laughs> Yeah, no, I was going to ask, Nosley, I think now is a good time for us to check in and ask you, how are we doing in terms of understanding you? How are we doing with empathy? Um, would you give up, we'll use the what's my grade technique. So what grade would you give us um, on empathy? Um, with my old heart, I would give you 100. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, and why? What What is it that, um, why, why are we getting 100? What's What's working for you? Because the, uh, not only the way you summarize it, but also both of your approaches and both of, and the tone of your voices really, um, in, in me, it's how to say, um, 
it created the feeling of being understood. And I also felt this um, genuineness, huh. genuineness, not like a, yeah. some words saying yeah. automatically. No, I really felt this genuineness in yeah. your tones and sayings. Thank you. That was really interesting. I mean, you and Jill have so much warmth and understanding with all of the people that you work with. It's really a joy to see that. And every time I see it, it's a learning experience for me. Thank you for your kind comments. You are the neatest person on the surface of the earth. I think you always have beautiful, really neat things to say oh, well, about you. people. And I, everybody appreciates it. I'm, I'm number one on your fan club. Um, but I, I would say that the, uh, it's also interesting that, uh, you know, I used to have those same insecurities that Nosley had on, I remember every Sunday I used to get terribly insecure about uh, my, having to see so many practice uh, patients the next day. And I'd think, my gosh, some of these, these are high powered business people, some of them. And I had a politician or two from time to time, uh, as well as many, you know, just ordinary folks like like you and me, Rhonda, but uh, I, I would get insecure and I would think, what what if they they notice that uh, I don't know what I'm doing and stuff like that? And then halfway through Monday morning, my anxiety would disappear because I'd realize they don't even notice that I don't know what I'm doing. It doesn't seem to make any difference. <laughs> but uh, the, the, Nosley has been worried about that. Maybe, maybe I'm not good enough. And, and over the years, we came to an absolute solution uh, for this. What, what is the solution? Well, the solution is the great tool that you designed, the Brief Mood Survey, where people tell you how they're feeling before and after a session in terms of their level of depression, their suicidal thoughts, their anger, their anxiety, their happiness level, and how they are feeling about one particular relationship of their choice. And then they also fill out the evaluation of the therapy session, where they actually give you, the therapist, feedback on how empathic you were, how helpful the session was, comments about the homework, and they can actually write out a narrative about what they liked about the session, what they don't liked about the session. And honestly, at this point in my career, I don't know if I could conduct therapy without those forms. I, I could not. Absolutely. It has been a tremendous game changer on so many different levels and has empowered me to become a way better therapist because a lot of times when I thought I was being empathic, I found out I was totally missing the boat with the patient and vice versa. And times when I thought I was doing great work, there was no change or the patient felt worse at the end. And I've had other sessions where I thought I was stinking up the place and the data showed me, my gosh, the patient loved this session and felt much better at the end. So tell us then, uh, Rhonda, why, why would Nosley or other therapists not immediately jump and get my brief mood survey and evaluation of therapy sessions, start using them in, in, in your clinical practice? What's holding people back? Because very few therapists do measurement and many therapists are dead set against it. They think it's like a, a, the, 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 the unforgivable sin. Well, I think par therapists that, are, that want their patient to just give them a narrative of their life over and over again, or talk about what they experienced in their childhood or their youth, or who want to free associate in the moment about what's going on right now without, I think those, that kind of therapy doesn't, I mean, those they may not be interested in measurements and maybe people won't want measurements because they won't want to hear what their patients actually think and think about them. They might be feeling insecure about the results or they might think they're going to take a, it's, this form is going to take up time in the therapy, you know, the necessary time. And it does take, it does take time because I've pointed out man, on many occasions that it takes at least 15 seconds to look <laughs> at your scores and sometimes as much as 30 seconds. Uh -huh. uh, but you've yeah. pointed out that it does require a little ex extra work, uh, that, uh, but not a lot. Yeah. And on the one hand, it could make you, it could make the therapist more in, in, insecure if they get negative feedback. On the other hand, 
once they learn how to give empathy using the five secrets, they can build a better relationship with their patient to understand where they missed the mark and how they could do better or how they could meet their patient's needs in a more realistic and a healthier, um, you know, yeah. more helpful way. Yeah. And, and, and a case like, and honestly, where you're sitting in the session thinking, I'm, you know, this patient probably is judging me and I'm not being effective and that type of thing, you can get the actual answers uh, right, right away. And then you can use that to transform your clinical work. And if you're not getting good results, then you can take a different strategy. Or if the patient marks you down on empathy, you can talk about it at the next session and find truth in what the patient is saying and, and, and grow that way and transform your relationships with people. But it does, it does take courage. The rewards are tremendous. The fears are intense mm -hmm. uh and the uh uh the resistance of, of therapists uh, can, can be intense as as well it, it's not a slam dunk because of the of the, the threat it poses to to all of us the uh, uh robert burns the poet from scotland with no uh no relationship but he he wrote this poem to a uh to a mouse, I think. And it ended up with, uh, but we had to memorize this stanza in, in high school, but what some power, the gift he gave us to see ourselves as others see us. Mm. In other words, would some power, the gift, give us the gift to see ourselves as others see us. Mm -hmm, exactly. Uh, and, uh, but a lot of us are afraid of that. But uh, you know, the other side of that, Oh, yes, a lot of us are, will be terrified by that, are terrified. The other side of that coin is we could get incredible feedback where people are telling us, our patients are telling us they like what they're doing, they mm -hmm. like, you know, they feel better, they're, they're achieving their goals, and that feels really good. Yeah, and I've had that after sessions that I thought were the worst therapy sessions I ever did. This person's going to hate me. And then look, look at the feedback and they're saying, Dr. Burns, this was the greatest hour of my life. This is yeah. the best uh, thing that ever happened. So you get surprised in all kinds of ways if you have the courage. So should we go on to the exciting conclusion of the Nosley session? Yeah. Yes. And once again, Nosley, uh, I want to thank you. Rhonda wants to thank you. All of our users will thank you for your tremendous courage and opening up and being being real. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, the director of the Feeling Great Therapy Center. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.